So, welcome back and uh, we were discussing about uh, environmental ethics and uh, we had initiated uh, this idea that environmental ethics has uh, to be uh, understood from uh, two points of views. One is uh, the scientific understanding of uh, the environment which is grounded uh, on causal relations. Another is uh, the intentional relationship which talks about environment as a field of uh, significance. Now, this whole idea about uh, talking about environment and nature, uh, environment and uh, human uh, engagement, uh, bringing them together into one uh, fold is, uh, is something uh, important because that creates uh, a larger scope that actually extends the domain of the morals. So, the moral extensionism talks about uh, the ecological sensibility of uh, human beings and that helps in uh, enlarging the scope of the morals, the morals within uh, the discourse of environmental studies. So, therefore, it is important that we need to talk about uh, uh, a radical shift in our approach and that radical shift is, uh, is about uh, a concept of self, what kind of self will really help us in understanding uh, this oneness that we are talking about. So, th that is what uh, I will be talking about in my next lecture. And the ultimate reconsideration of values uh, is something is also important you know, when we talk about uh, the oneness of uh, the reality. So, there are two books which I have referred in this uh, uh, talk in the previous talk and uh, I also had referred uh, to David Cooper's uh, essay on the idea of environment uh, which is of course not been uh, written here, but um, I will be posting you uh, with that. I was uh, as I was mentioning about uh, a new of my study on environmental ethics that is uh, on the ecological self and understanding. I will be uh, in fact, interested to uh, bring in this concept of ecological self to you and how do I conceive this uh, uh, idea. Uh, I see a big uh, kind of a departure is necessary when we talk about the notion of ecological self, the notion of oneness between the environment and uh, uh, the human life. Now, to conceive that oneness, to construe a kind of a holistic environmental ethics, we perceive a kind of a uh, change is necessary. That is, the change is from a it conception of nature to thou conception of nature. This shift is, uh, is very important. This shift is important in this sense that whenever uh, we talk about nature, we uh, we used to conceive it that as an uh, object. Uh, nature is treated as an object, that is what is, I call an it conception of uh, nature. And when is nature is conceived as a, as a subject, uh, as subject at, at par with uh, the individual uh, being, I talk about a thou conception of nature. In fact, these two terms are borrowed from a famous uh, uh, philosopher Martin Buber whose uh, essay is I and Thou. Uh, I will talk about, I will elaborate upon it in my, uh, towards the concluding uh, section of uh, the notion of ecological self. But this basic idea has to be clarified here is that, that the, the classical understanding of environment treats environment as an object, whereas the concept of ecological self tries to make a shift uh, stating that the environment is not to be treated as an object. It is at par with the subject who is valuing it and uh, that is how it is called an I thou uh, relationship. And to understand that we need to talk about values in nature and nature of values. These two things are have to be clarified. Values in nature we know that there are specific values in nature. Uh, say for example, human beings as a species have, are valuable. Similarly, animals are also valuable, plants are also valuable. So, there are 
they are valuable because they have some specific features, there are characteristics which are very important uh, for their way of living and we cannot undermine those values. And once we undermine that, we try to reduce them to something else, which we often do uh, in the case of an eat conception of nature. So, our if we are looking for an alternative theoretical framework uh, of understanding environmental ethics, we also need to uh, look at re-examine the nature of uh, uh, beings, the values uh, of beings uh, and the nature of values, values in nature and nature of values. Now, when we talk about nature of values, there are two ideas here, one is the values are sometimes uh, intrinsically associated or necessarily associated with the being or thing or we find that values are externally associated with the things. So, when we talk about nature of values, these two uh, concepts are to be analyzed. One is the, in, the notion of intrinsic value, that is the value in itself, a thing having value in itself and another is uh, the concept of uh, extrinsic value, the non intrinsic value is something very important. Then the other concept uh, is about moral agents and moral subjects. This subject object dichotomy is uh, indeed a, a consequence of the modernist vision of the reality. We treat the individual as a subject and the world, the rest of the world or the other as an object. So, this whole engagement with uh, uh, human beings, with nature is treated uh, in this framework, in a dual framework. And this So, the dichotomy exists like the self and other dichotomy, the self and the world dichotomy. I and U dichotomy. So, this division is has to be breached and that can be breached theoretically provided we try to bring in a new uh, concept uh, called moral uh, agent and moral subjects. Some philosophers have used talked about the difference between agency and patient, agent patient relationship. So, uh, that we have to be understood then as one of our fellow uh, participants were pointing out in the previous section, we find that this idea is uh, and of what kind of alternative vision uh, that uh, environmental ethics uh, in 21st century is uh, uh, conceptualizing. The alternative vision is about an ecocentric uh, ethics or ecocentric world view. Uh, I treat them as synonymous life centric or ecocentric. They may be there may be terminological differences, but for our understanding let us uh, treat them as a kind of a synonymous term that life is at the center and, um, and that is important for you know, establishing the relationship with uh, um, everything that, uh, that is there uh, in the universe. So, this intentional connectedness or the familiarity uh, that I was uh, discussing with reference to uh, the notion of uh, intentional field can be brought in uh, if we put life at the center. Life is the basic principle on which we need to develop an alternative uh, outlook. Now, this shift from anthropocentrism to life centric world view uh, will have, uh, uh, will not ignore uh, this idea of uh, what is objectively valuable. Now, this objective objectivity has to be uh, understood little carefully, because very often we try to reduce values either to our individual interest or to the group's interest or the community's interest. And that uh, causes uh, a serious harm uh, or that becomes a threat to our environmental concern, our ethical concern, um, because what is good for an individual may not be good for uh, the other individual. 
uh, what is good for one community may not be good for the other community as you know we are discussing that whether you know environmental ethics would talk about uh, moral principles that are relative or whether uh, we need to talk about environmental principles that are universal. Here I am suggesting that we should have an objective understanding of uh, those moral principles uh, which are suitable for the entire humanity. So, it is in, in that sense a basic sense of objectivity needs to be granted uh, or to be opted for, uh, so that we do not The second point is that there is a telos in this, uh, this whole uh, conceptualization of uh, a moral world, an ecological world. Uh, the telos is that every individual being has a purpose. Now, this is typically an Aristotelian thinking, which I am trying to address to. Um, Aristotle believed that every being has a purpose. So, every being has a purpose means there is a telos uh, attached to our form of life and uh, we need to unfold that uh, telos, we need to uncover that, so that we live a meaningful uh, life. So, uh, so, so, it is in that sense uh, there is a teleological perspective um, to be attached, because otherwise we cannot really uh, propose this notion of ethics. Why I am saying this is that this whole concept of environmental ethics or to live in an ethical world is very important for everyone. It is a perspective that we need to develop. It is a perspective that we not only need to develop, but also live with it. Now, unless we talk about that perspective, unless our approach is perspectival, we cannot talk about values that are required for a sustainable development or values that are required for meaningful life. Because a new world is to be conceptualized from the point of view of a perspective, there is a perspective associated with it. So, it is in, in that sense it is Aristotelian and it is teleological. The other one is uh, the notion of community and uh, systems. As I said earlier, there are various types of communities, there are various types of uh, being say for example, an animal world and the human world and the other the endangered species uh, is also one kind of a community. So, and you have there are various many ecosystems are connected with each other. So, uh, we need to uh, thread them, we need to neatly uh, actually connect them, so that they become part of a holistic teleological uh, study of you know um, environment. So, uh, nothing has to be you know to be left out. So, it is the point is we need to become inclusive, not exclusive in our approach. The second, uh, the other point which uh, uh, really justifies to, to, to this idea of ecological self is that, that when we talk about a self, a self has various dimension. Okay. So, and that has to be you know, seen the biological dimension as my fellow participant pointed out earlier uh, during the questionnaire session that there is an economic dimension. Now, in, in today's society our basic concern has becoming more and more economic rather than anything else. And so, so it, it is in that context economic is, is a very important aspect of human life. See we are uh, and there is also a social concern and all these uh, to be integrated together. The biological uh, purpose of life, the economic purpose of life and there is a social purpose of life. And 
they together will you know, form uh, a larger telos that, that together will define a larger uh, you know, a telos of uh, uh, human life. So, so it, it is in that context one can uh, think of uh, why we need to integrate them, the need of integration and that has to be deeply felt and unless we feel that uh, it is necessary, uh, such a perspective will be uh, you know, uh, will not be possible. Now, uh, Cooper uh, whom I referred in my uh, earlier session talk, uh, talks about uh, when he defines this oneness, he writes, I quote him, uh, given man's capacities for speech and self reflection, for instance, slogan to the effect that people are as a part of the nature as mountains, fish, clear need to be balanced by ones which recalls people's transcendence of the natural. So, uh, you look at uh, the human uh, life, human life as I pointed out that is always progressive, it always you know uh, look at development uh, as something it is priority. So, therefore, there is always a vision for an ideal and there is always a vision for a utopia society. I am not saying that whether that utopia is possible, is realizable, but what I am trying to uh, suggest here is that, that such an utopia is a part and parcel of uh, human existence and it is inevitable that human being will not, it is inevitable that we will not escape from this uh, utopian vision of uh, reality. Now, utopia is always a kind of a, uh, always gives a transcendence feeling, because that which is existing is not something uh, ideal, that which is an ideal is not existing uh, out there or uh, that which is an ideal I am not living with, living in that world. So, my ideal is always a new world, the ideal is always a better world, hence there is a sense of transcendence uh, attached to it. Now, the other point is that human being, human life, human abilities uh, is something very unique, they are unique in this sense, they are speaking beings, they are linguistic beings and they are self conscious beings. Now, language is something very uniquely associated with human life. It is not that the other species do not share, do not communicate. No, but in the case of human, you find a kind of a uh, new uh, facet uh, of life in which we uh, communicate with each other, we share with each other and that sharing is based on certain normative conditions. Say for example, uh, human beings uh, do make promise. When I say I will pay you uh, 100 dollars, I do mean it. Now, such a promise is in fact a kind of performative utterances. It is as good as uh, you know, uh, making a case of paying 100 rupees note and if I disown it, then I, it is it, it's a moral lapse on my part. So, a philosopher called, uh, named John Searle refers to uh, this idea of uh, human beings um, that is that in while speaking we not only perform activities, but we perform a rule governed activities. So, um, human intentional attitudes are therefore, deontic in nature. Human intentionality or human intentional attitude per se is intrinsically deontic in nature. Uh, that is what uh, Sal says you know makes a kind of a big difference when we compare human life with uh, the life of the other species. Um, and human beings are self reflective beings, they not only have uh, not only conscious of themselves, but also they are conscious of what kind of self they have or they try to reform their self. Now, this reformative attitude, this transformative attitude um, is an attitude 
based on this deontic uh, power of their uh, intentionality is something which is important. Now, uh, Searle does make a claim that um, the other species will have some kind of a self identity, uh, but that will be a lesser kind of a self identity than the human beings. Uh, the human identity is something uh, grounded on certain normative consciousness. Uh, so, it is not just merely a self conscious attitude, but it is self conscious normative attitude. This is something I think we need to keep in mind when we talk about an ecological self, a self a transformative self which is, uh, uh, which is possible. Now, uh, when I say what we are and why we should care for nature, the two things come to mind which uh, is again uh, taken from one of the very eminent scholar of environmental ethics uh, of our time today, Derek William Postoma. Postoma says that we need to care for nature, we have a duty um, towards environment or we are committed to restore or preserve uh, environment is because we are all human beings. So, uh, we are human beings is something very unique, you know, one can justify uh, it from the perspective of, uh, the, of Searle's uh, idea that, that how human intentional attitudes are deontic attitudes. In other words, human beings uh, intentional engagement with the world has been uh, value laden uh, is from a moral perspective. So, there is a sense of commitment, there is a sense of obligation which is expressed in every human engagement. Now, uh, whether you uh, talk uh, with your friends or uh, we make a promise, you now Searle's basic idea is about assertions. So, wh when we assert, we make you know a strong, uh, we express a st strong sense of commitment and obligations. So, the whole human linguistic engagement is therefore, value laden. It is from that point of view that we are all human beings uh, and being a human is not, you know, not a simple thing. The other point is that, that we are all citizen. When we become citizen, our responsibility increases. I mean, we own a tremendous sense of responsibility towards other citizens or towards other um, members of uh, the community. So, it is, it is in that context. Now, how individual is uh, because he is a human being or she is a human being and she is also a citizen. And uh, I think that is uh, to be kept in mind when we talk about uh, an ecological self, the possibility of realizing the notion of ecological self. Before getting into uh, this idea, I did mention that we need to talk about the shift that is taking place between an id conception of nature to the Tao conception of nature. Uh, and the, the shift is uh, in a id concept of nature, what are the presuppositions? What are the logical presuppositions when we talk about an id concept, uh, conception of nature? The response is humans are the centers of the universe. In the case of id conception of nature, where human beings treat the entire nature as an object, because they think that the everything is for their use, everything has value because it is for them. So, it, it is in that context, we start developing a human centric world view and not a life centric world view. So far, right from Aristotle onwards, even in Kant, we will have a discussion on that. In Kant, we have been seeing that we are living in a human centric world. And in a human centric world, humans are only morally significant and other creatures are not. So, it is in that context, uh, you know, human beings treat themselves as a tutelar God. So, because they are made in the image of God. So, this is a kind of a um, temperament, this is a kind of a, a normative attitude which every human uh, agent uh, carries with uh, them. So, that attitude need to be reformed. Now, if we keep that attitude on, then uh, we will be destroying nature 
as and we have already destroyed it and that is how the crises are um, are encountered uh, in our everyday life so uh, destruction of uh, of nature can only be seized can only be freezed rather if we start uh, believing that everything in the world are uh, meaningful everything in the world has a purpose and every individual has the responsibility to you uh, know care for other individual to care for other non human beings and non other entities in the world because we are all together here we are all together here existing to realize a common purpose and that is where we can succeed in freezing the destruction that has been happening to the uh, nature so the natural world exists only for the benefit of human beings is something wrong it is a moral failure rather to consider uh, this concept where human are at the center and natural world is only for the benefit of the human beings i am not saying that we should stop using things what i am trying to suggest that the way we have been using that needs to be reformed okay so and that is where we need to treat uh, the other something intrinsically valuable as it it is uh, in the case of human beings we every human beings think that they are valuable uh, beings every individual uh, believe that he is valuable or she is valuable and nobody undermines their own existence if everybody starts believing that then that will spread the message of individualism and which is wrong in a society in a holistic society where we try to talk about uh, a purposeful living living for a better world or living for a meaningful life societal normative framework we need to consider we are morally obliged to the other uh, entities we are morally obliged to other living beings we are morally obliged to all beings that that's what it is now that will help us in understanding what good life means uh, that will help us you uh, know creating a better world now i also mentioned in the, my previous lecture referring to this idea of uh, uh, socrates um, who said an unexamined life is not worth uh, living now socrates uh, lived in a world where slavery was uh, prevailing uh, in athens so uh, but socrates uh, believed that every individuals that is one negative aspect of the society where you know um, slavery was existing but think of this statement uh, independent of that um, kind of uh, form of life but think of the statement relating to individual life that every individual has uh, this responsibility to care for uh, you know to reexamine one's own uh, life now unless we reexamine ourselves then we will not be able to perform our duties rights etc etc so it is in this context uh, i would uh, uh, know like to narrate a story of uh, um story which uh, plato mentioned in one of his famous parable called the parable of cave now uh, this parable is important because uh, it helps us you know um, changing our conception of the world now plato uh, story of the cave says that there is a cave and um there are prisoners kept uh inside the cave the prisoners feet and hands were very tightly you know um rope in such a way that they cannot even turn and see what is behind the cave what is what is happening behind behind the cave there is a, there is a small small path leading to the entrance of the cave and there was also a fireplace the prisoners are used to see that there is some kind of a movement which was happening on the wall of the cave 
Now the prisoners have believed that those movements those are real. Now this is what is uh, you know Socrates is uh, uh, trying to prove. Now once you start believing that something is real then you cannot change the framework, the, we cannot change the way of thinking like my fellow participant was saying that how do you know uh, arrest this corruption, how do you eliminate corruption. Now because it is me who is uh, not doing uh, corrupt, others are doing, how to do that? At this point I would try to relate you know uh, the Plato's uh, prisoners who believed that nothing is real, what is real is only those reflections, those shadows which were you know, shown in the, on the wall of the cave. Plato believes uh, that one of the prisoner, this is how the story goes, one of the prisoners uh, tries to turn and turn in such a way that he succeeded eventually freeing himself and he walks out to the entrance of the cave. Now this is a very important statement of Plato. Uh, he says that one who tries and one who tries again and again and he succeeds eventually reaching at the entrance and once he reaches at the entrance he is not able to see things because there is so much of light outside that he is not able to open his eyes. Slowly he succeeds in you know, opening his eyes and sees things as they are. This is something very uh, meaningful for all of us because if we try to reform ourselves at an individual level and this becomes a part of our habit, this then we will definitely succeed in seeing things as they are, which Plato's prisoner ultimately you know, uh, succeeded in uh, seeing things as they are. And the other aspect of the story goes like this, and once the prisoner saw that there is a difference between the shadows and the things which are out uh, there in the world, then he felt that it is his responsibility that he should go back to the uh, cave and tell his fellow prisoners that the reality is out there. These are only appearances and appearances are not real. So Plato makes a, 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 an important distinction between appearance and a reality. So the kind of life, the consumeristic society in which we all live, kind of life that we have accepted as something very significant is needs to be questioned and questioned from our personal uh, perspective, from a rational perspective and that will help us seeing things as they are. And therefore, this the fellow prisoner who was, you know, uh, who had gone out uh, felt that it is his responsibility to go back inside to the uh, cave and tell his fellow prisoners. Now, this responsibility is the responsibility of all enlightened citizen. Those who are enlightened citizens, uh, they must, they have double sense of responsibility. And that is where, uh, you know, I was talking about uh, the, our responsibility for the future generation. So, duties, rights, care, affection, love, compassion become important to live a good life. The life that the fellow prisoners tried to leave when he tried to move out and also felt equally sympathetic for his own friends who were you know, in living inside. But unfortunately, this is the end of the uh, story, unfortunately when the, the fellow prisoners comes in, the other prisoners were not able to understand what he was uh, speaking. So the, everything uh, had changed, his language so uh, had changed. Uh, so, he failed to communicate to his fellow prisoners. Now, one thing uh, has to be kept in mind, the, the life centric ethics tries to speak in a new language, in a new language of ethics where values are grounded on uh, a sense of uh, care, 
uh, values are grounded on sense of compassion, a deep sense of love and compassion, so that everybody lives happily to realize their purpose. So, the teleological uh, view of life can be only be realized if you uh, talk about uh, a holistic life centric ethics. Can I have some question uh, uh, here? Sir, how we can motivate the students in the classroom to follow the environmental ethics? How to motivate uh, uh, the students? We should uh, uh, cite the examples of uh, people who are doing well for uh, or who have done good for the environment. So, for example, Sundarlal Bahuguna will be an, a moral exemplar so far as environmental ethics is concerned. So, if you uh, can cite an example like that or look at the Vishnois of Rajasthan, uh, the kind of uh, life that they live, you know, uh, live with other non-human beings, okay. uh, that could be an example. So, uh, the, there are n number of examples, such examples who have done something uh, valuable for uh, the environment. So, uh, I think they are our motivations, source of motivation. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir, one more question. Oh, please. Uh, uh, sir, when we are talking about the uh, uh, different type of, there are a different type of ethics for the holistic development of the particular subject. Mm. Uh, I think uh, during this lecture, uh, your uh, lecture is uh, very related and informative related with the environmental ethics, sir. Yes. Uh, when we, when we taking the particular lecture, during uh, this is my personal experience of one decades about the uh, related with the environmental studies uh, why this particular subject not be uh, giving uh, extra value focus like other subjects why we provide uh, only the grades this is the reason according to my opinion this is the reason students can't be much more attractive particular this particular subject you are agree with the, this uh, view, sir? I do not know why it is not there, but uh, uh, this has been one of the uh, topic which is much discussed in the environmental studies uh, uh, component in IIT Bombay. And, uh, but why it is not there uh, as an independent uh, uh, course uh, called environmental ethics uh, is something uh, has to be uh, particularly no, uh, look at by our policy makers, uh, um, I, I have no idea why it is not there, but uh, it will be good, really good if it is there. Sir, um, my concern is that sir, uh, we not only in India, although whole global, whole universe, uh, we are talking about the universe, we, yes. we are in the whole universe, we are talking about the environmental study, global warming, different types of ethics related with the development of the environmental science, yes. but, but in particular curriculum, uh. we are giving less importance, yes, yes. because uh, th this is just like a grade, a student can understand that, oh, uh, environmental science, just we have to pass, we have to grade A, B, C, D, blah, 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 uh. but when we providing the particular marks like uh, 28, 20%, 80%, 70%, 30%, 50, 50 and so on, then I think according to me, we all are technocrat, we all are active, we all are uh, responsibility, fundamental responsibility and fundamental duty that how we can save our environmental science and particular earth, particular universe in our particular area, but we, we giving less importance. What is your view, sir, on this particular uh, environmental now, ethics? Time has come to, uh, to change ourselves and I am sure uh, the, the society will change. So, uh, the kind of crisis that we are facing today, uh, like global warming or uh, pollution, um, etc., climate change, that has become a, a topic of research and study in many universities in the world. Many universities in the world, uh, eminent universities, um, and fine research scholars are working on these areas. So, 
um, India is always late, you know, to adopt. So um, maybe we need to, uh, you know, wake up ourselves and uh, catch uh, the train, which is uh, already started running. So that is that is what I would say. We will be celebrating just uh, Environmental Day in 2015 and uh, our theme is 7 billion dreams, one planet, consume care, consume with care, but uh, uh, we, we, how we can fulfill our uh, dreams, forthcoming dreams, futuristic dream for this particular saving sir. We can always realize our dream, provided we try, like the Petos, uh, no, the prisoner who tried and tried his best to move out and eventually he succeeded. Similarly, if we start reforming ourselves, if you start changing our attitude towards the environment, then I am sure uh, no, all of us, if not we in reality, but our future generation will you know, uh, see that such a world was given to us and we need to be doubly responsible for making it possible for the, uh, the next generation. So, I think every this attempt uh, will be a fruitful attempt. So, I am not sure that we will be able to realize in this, you know, in the coming 30 years or coming 10 years. It is a long route and I think it is, but it is a difficult route and it is possible that we can uh, make our journey better and suffer if we, you know, uh, if we show our promise and if we change our attitude and then uh, eventually the, the next generation will reap the consequence. Uh, what is the uh, environmental ethics behind deforestation? You are cutting the trees for so many purposes for paper industries and then during some of the process. What is the ethics behind that process? First of all, see deforestation, uh, cutting down uh, the rainforest is something definitely very, very wrong. That is the wrong thing that we have been doing if the rainforests are abolished. Cutting down trees without you know, a proper plantation program is another thing. Shifting trees from one place to another for various developmental purposes is yet to be you know, uh, adopted by our policy makers. So, we do not have proper technology to replant trees. Okay. Uh, when we make, say, say for example, if we, when we make a good road, you know, there are, we just go randomly cut the trees. We do not replant them, we do not have the mechanism to you know, um, transplant trees. But when we talk about deforestation, which is exclusively cutting down the rainforest at the high altitude, that is something which is not pardonable at all. Uh, I mean, nobody can create a rainforest, you know, uh, in, in 20 years or 30 years time. So, uh, that is something wrong and, uh, and that is where we need to talk about a new way of looking at environmental ethics. Uh, we need to treat uh, the trees as moral subjects. So, they are part and parcel of human um, uh, form of life. So, we cannot say that the trees are trees and humans are humans and they are to be used only for uh, the benefit of the human beings. Sir, actually, yes. sir, in, uh, in case of pollution control, what actually happening is okay. those who can really execute it, uh, they are not doing it properly and those who understand, they cannot execute. So, yes. my, uh, the actual thing is the politicians uh. or the pollution control board, uh. they are not showing enough ethics to control yes. it and yes. they are so much bribed and corrupted, so yes. these are not getting executed. So, this is the lack of motivational factor to tell to the students. Uh. So, because in the Bhopal gas tragedy also, Yes. Uh, since the actual person is not at punished debt. True, so, true. we do not have the solid example to motivate the students. No, Can no, you have no, any we, word on we, this? No, no, I, the, the previous question, if you uh, no, uh, recollect, uh, somebody was looking for how to motivate uh, no, uh, our students. Now, motivation uh, should come from the good examples. I agree with you that the Popol tragedy and um, such uh, no, uh, events are 
uh, are part and parcel of uh, no, uh, our society in which we all live. Uh, society has becoming a, um, become a corrupt society, but we also live in a society which is which has good examplars like now we have Vandana Siva, we have Sundarlal Bahuguna, uh, we have uh, Panduranga Hegde, you know, uh, who was very deeply uh, inspired by Sundarlal Bahuguna, it's a program, and uh, Sundarlal Bahuguna himself was Gandhian. So, uh, if you look at um, them, uh, or if you also look at the Bisnois of Rajasthan, okay. Uh, who have really protected their environment, not only protected their physical environment, but also the, the, the other non-human beings who are living like antelope uh, and others, they really you know, uh, breast feed them, they, they, they take them as a part and parcel of their family. So, uh, if you look at their form of life, then we have good exemplars. Okay. And uh, Sundarlal Bahugunas that uh, Padayatra was, was a very successful uh, Padayatra, uh, where he could really stop you know, uh, the deforestation which was happening at the high altitude. Uh, so, therefore, the basic urge is that we need to act. Awareness is something okay, something fine, but awareness itself is not enough. Uh, it is important that we act against it. So, therefore, we need to have or look at that uh, in, uh, in Kerala, there, was, there is this uh, movement, silent valley movement, you know, which, which was one of the successful movement, where many poets, uh, Kerala Sahitya Parishad was very active. It is not about the science, not only the scientists, but also the poets, the other intellectuals, who actively participated to restore the silent valley uh, you know, uh, project. So, now uh, the question is there are number of examples, but we only need to uh, set good examples and cite the case of good ag moral exemplars uh, to motivate our uh, students and motivate ourselves as well. Uh, that is really right sir, but uh, in uh, one of the industrial cases I will tell you sir, sir actually when there is a rainy time that uh, industrial effluents and all they do not treat also. But uh, for the pollution control board, even if they come, everything will be on paper. So, only for the documentary, but the, they will take the bribe money. So, until that stops, uh, it is very difficult to happen. Sir. Yes, yes. Because, the, I uh, agree. I <laughs> fully agree with you that unless we change ourselves, nothing is uh, no, possible. We will, we will be only setting bad examples. That, that is very, very true. So, th therefore, we need to awareness we need to create a movement, a collective movement. If 10 people speak, if 100 people speak, then thousands will join. So, uh, so that environment has to be created. Environmental crisis or uh, ethical crisis. Yes. Uh, it is, uh, I feel that uh, due to changes in our priorities. Yes. Uh, we have become more uh, self-centered. Yes, yes. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, we are what we feel that uh, career centric. Ha, so our okay. first priority is our career. Ha, then not career by exactly. our family. We are becoming more money centric. So, uh, the, the entire uh, relation we see, we map you know, through money. Yes. Not career centric actually. Money centric. Okay, sir. Mm. So, we can money centric. Yeah. Then second comes, second priority comes our family yes. and then last comes the nature or God. Yes. Whereas, if we can reverse this, uh, this uh, whole aspect upside down, yes. if we keep the nature or God our first priority, yes. family second priority and our, you know, what is called that uh, uh, money centric or uh, our, uh, you know, that uh, earning and all those things. Yes, yes. Last, hmm. if we keep society before us, then hmm. I think we can set right the environment, the ethics, morals, everything. Yes. Now, uh, now I will I will uh, tell you, we uh, unfortunately we uh, bring God for our wrong priorities. In the case of money priorities, God is also brought, 
but in a wrong ways. So, that is very unfortunate one, but, the, but you are extremely right in saying that uh, nature itself is God. Look at this uh, Sankara's whole idea of uh, you know uh, Brahman, okay. Sarva Khalidam Brahman, Everything, everywhere God is present including all beings. Okay. It is not that God is present in human beings alone, but he is manifested everywhere. Okay. So, this manifestation has to be realized, is not it? And if we do not have this basic concern of realization, then uh, things will go wrong. I, uh, we are thankful to you for a very inspiring uh, lecture. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you. Sir, as like, sir, as like IS course, is there any course related to endometrics? Is there any course or rules or anything? Uh, there are books on environmental ethics, but whether the course is there, uh, I am not very sure. Whether the, there is a, you uh, know, um, this course, uh, environmental ethics course, is taught you know, uh, um, in the departments like philosophy, okay, uh, as a one of the applied philosophies or applied ethics. Like you have engineering ethics, you have um, medical ethics, similarly you have environmental ethics as one of the applied subject. Now, uh, ethics as you all know, like logic and uh, things like that are taught in the discipline called philosophy it is a branch of philosophy. So, therefore, such course is existing in the, uh, in the department of philosophy, but whether it has been taught in all the institutes uh, or not, I am not very sure, but it is one of the component of environmental studies, which is been taught here in IIT Bombay. And as we had seen the UGC syllabus, uh, we found that such component is existing in the curriculum. One more question, sir. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any laws or regulations that is amended by the government for uh, environmental ethics? As we know that environmental ethics leads to sustainable development of yes. our community. Uh, we can't uh, do this by only uh, studying or motivating to students. We have to do something uh, more than that. Uh, what is the feasibility of it? And your suggestion, sir, please. In when we talk about environmental ethics, we try to morally reform the uh, whole attitude of our policy makers, our fellow citizens. Okay. So, we all are included uh, know, in that category, that is my first response. Second response is that there is no yes or no uh, principles that this ought to be followed and nothing else. So, if a pollution control board makes a kind of a principle that this is when uh, an industry starts polluting and that has to be stopped and that, that becomes a principle, that becomes a moral principle. Suppose we, uh, we form a kind of a principle that at, at the high altitude like say you know um, 11,000 altitude onwards we will not cut the tree for any uh, business purposes, then that becomes a principle that has to be followed. So, similarly all the principles are to be practically formulated by the community uh, or the society okay, and that has to be strictly followed. Now, uh, otherwise here with me there is no uh, know, categorical principles that this is what is to be followed. We all know that pollution is happening. We all know that uh, you know, um, deforestation is um, uh, rampantly happening, is not it? And that is bad. So, good and bad is something which is which one can judge. But sometimes, like our fellow participants were pointing out, sometimes our policy makers ignore this, our engineers are ignoring this. Okay, when they can take a decision or our politicians are ignoring this and that is where we set wrong examples. If they show moral concern for the society, for the environment, then 
we can change um, our environment and the, we can see that how it is possible. Say for example, Ganga cleaning uh, uh, activity which is the prime minister's uh, great project now is to be initiated. Now, I think if we succeed in doing that, we will be able to set a good example, is it not? So, I was uh, um, discussing um, about uh, uh, that how we treat environment as an object and whether it is possible to treat environment as a subject and with reference to this, we had a couple of uh, questions, um, but now uh, I would like to reflect upon that how uh, in, during the modern period, uh, during the enlightenment period this species politics was also part of the entire philosophical and intellectual uh, history. Uh, in the species politics, you will you find that you know, individual human beings uh, benefit is always you know, looked after, whereas others were been uh, not part of the ethical discourse. So, uh, others here mean that non-human beings have not been included in the core of uh, environmental ethics program. So, Kant is one of the examples, though he says that uh, human beings are to be treated as an end in itself okay, uh, and every individual has, uh, uh, has an end, but he does not really uh, include uh, the other uh, inferior beings, the, le the less rational beings. Uh, in this category. Marx, uh, for, for example, is one of them who also talks about uh, the deification of nature. The nature becomes the first time simply an object of mankind, purely a matter of utility. So, uh, I was talking about utilitarians and we will talk more uh, on this tomorrow when we talk about animal ethics, but Marx himself had looked at uh, and the nature or the objects uh, in the world from a utilitarian uh, perspective. And so also uh, Freud, Freud said, Freud suggested that right way of to sublimate human aggression was to direct it away from other people against the rest of biosphere. So, see this, this whole western uh, world which was, uh, no, um, which uh, this is what Freud's observation is that if it is constantly engaged in um, fighting um, in, in the war, then that can be that negative attitude can be shifted to uh, the non-human beings uh, to or what we call the rest of biosphere by becoming a member of human community. And with the help of a technique, uh, technique guided by science going over the attack against the nature by subject, uh, subjecting her to the human will. So, uh, so, therefore, everything that exists in the universe is for, uh, for the benefit of human interest only. So, this is uh, the debate uh, continues even in 90s by Passmore, uh, Passmore writes I quote it is e easy to foresee that in the future when science and technology have attained, uh, have attended to a perfection which we are as yet unable to visualize, nature will become soft wax in a man's hand, which will be able to cast into whatever form he chooses. So, uh, this, this whole enlightenment project is try to control, have a control over nature. We are not only predicting the nature and natural objects, the whole uh, scientific approach or technological advancement has been to, you know, uh, has been there to control nature. And that is something wrong uh, in a sense that, I mean uh, 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 not in absolute terms of course, but th that is something uh, possibly uh, that human society has uh, taken a wrong route to, you uh, know, uh, live with nature. Um, because nature is our home, we live in nature and we need to treat nature uh, at par with uh, the human. So, that, that, is the, that is the basic approach. 
So, uh, therefore, a new science uh, that we are talking about, the new scientific rationality that is necessary for the de development of an ecological self will say that will destroy the classical symbolism that man is not a tutelar god, man is not just made in the image of god, okay. uh, rather man is an accidental, uh, man's arrival in the universe is an accident. So, uh, and that is what the biology confirms us. The evolutionary biology uh, tells us that this is how man has been uh, connected to, man has a history, the arrival of man has a history and we are all connected um, and that connection has to be, you know, uh, scientifically stressed. So, uh, so, so, so therefore, in, in this, um, in that context, one can uh, one can think of a connecting principle, an integrating integrating uh, principle, uh, which will be a, a guiding force uh, for all of us. Then we uh, all uh, know that everything in nature are valuable, values in nature, we have valuable human beings, uh, animals, other organisms, valuable species and valuable ecosystems, all these are valuable. And if somebody has read uh, a philosopher called Rene Descartes, Descartes says that uh, I think therefore, I am and he also says that I doubt uh, that I think and therefore, I am. Now, this whole uh, debate about uh, the I, the existence of I, uh, the supremacy of the self is something uh, very, uh, very important and that is important because I cannot doubt that I value. In the same line of Descartes, one can argue that I cannot doubt that I value. So, so man is always uh, a source of valuing uh, agent. And similarly, uh, in the classical uh, period, you have uh, you have Protagoras who uh, had a very famous slogan uh, during the time of Socrates that uh, man is the measure of all things. So, uh, human values have been always part of our discourse, discourse in ethics or, but it is also important, it is also equally important that we should uh, see the values in the case of animals and other uh, biotic beings. Because uh, an organism is self-sustaining, an animal who also looks for you know, uh, his or uh, her self-identity you know, within its community, it's, it has its own form of life. And, um, many activities that the animal performs uh, or the mammals do like bait, we cannot perform that. So, they the species are uh, having some specific qualities, specific features which is uh, not reducible to human uh, beings alone. So, therefore, what I am trying to suggest here is that every biotic being has a value there is a value in nature, whether it is about mammals, whether it is about uh, the endangered species, whether it is about uh, any organisms like plants and uh, any living creatures, all beings in the uh, which are living in the ecosystems are valuable. So, uh, I would also like to point out that there is a inherent worth in um, everything. There is, as I said that there is a telos uh, and the teleological perspective has to be re-enchanted, then we need to see that every being has an end to realize, there is an end in itself. And this idea of end in itself will, uh, will take us to the difference between what is intrinsic value and what is uh, instrumental value or extrinsic value. Intrinsic value is something that there is a the value in itself, value if it is good and desirable in itself. Like according to Kant, whom we refer to, talks about that every individual has an end in itself. So, the existence of an individual does not depend on other um, uh, beings in the, in the universe. So, every individual has 
a purpose, every individual performs activities which is a desirable, that ability itself defines the end. So, every individual human beings have intrinsic value. Now, the objects, the things in the world have instrumental values, because according to the classical uh, ethics, you have or a human centered ethics, everything is to serve the purpose of or everything has to fulfill the desire of the human beings. So, therefore, it is important that we need to reconsider the things that are existing around us with this idea that they also have an intrinsic value. So, the, so therefore, this difference has to be taken into account when we study uh, what is intrinsic value, whether the non-human beings have intrinsic value or not. Like I, as I said, there is uh, this difference between subject object, the dichotomy that exists between the subject and the object. Um, has to be eliminated, has to be resolved and that can only be resolved provided we ascribe certain values, certain intrinsic values. Rather, we not only ascribe, we see some intrinsic value in those biotic beings uh, or in all biotic beings that are existing uh, in the universe. So, this is, uh, this is a, a quotation from uh, by Postoma. Uh, from Oranel, who writes, nature is regarded uh, to have intrinsic value, if and in so far as the value of nature is not limited to the instrumental use we make of it. Nature is valued not merely as a means to some few further end, but as an end in itself, good for its own sake, as an end, as distinct from good as a means to uh, something else, unquote. So, so this idea of Oranel is, uh, is something uh, very interestingly delved into uh, the discourse of environmental ethics, because unless we, unless an individual or unless a policy maker or unless an, a moral agent sees the values of uh, nature or the environment having an intrinsic value we cannot, uh, we cannot change or we cannot formulate a life centric ethics. That is the, uh, that is the message I would like to uh, give. Now, this is an example uh, that I was talking about. See, when we, uh, when, the, when a builder uh, know, uh, starts making building around the Pawai lake, we have, we look at the lake having an instrumental uh, value because that makes my building uh, profitable business, because we can see it uh, to uh, the lake from your house. Now, here we give an instrumental value or we attribute an instrumental value to uh, the water body, okay. and, but water body in itself uh, has intrinsic value, because so many living uh, creatures are dependent on water bodies. So, uh, like lake and river and things like that. So, we therefore, we need to change our attitude and um, that will help us in considering uh, whether the biotic beings rather than you know, um, excluding the human beings have intrinsic value. There is also uh, uh, this notion of objective value which I talked about in the beginning of uh, my uh, talk in this session, uh, where uh, from the point of view of epistemology, that is the theory of knowledge, we make a distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic value. Okay. But um, this distinction is not only epistemological, but uh, it, is a, it is an ep epistemological distinction that something which is objective, something which is subjective. Subjective in this sense that I value it or my family values it or my students value it or my community value it, that makes value subjective or relative as I was talking about. So, this kind of objective subjective distinction in the case of value 
is a matter of a epistemological distinction. An another point which I would like to uh, bring to your notice that when we talk about such an epistemology, when we talk about such a uh, uh, knowledge and knowledge shift in uh, the knowledge um, framework, we also need to look at how such a teleological thinking is possible. Uh, and that is what uh, one of the contemporary philosophers uh, or 20th century philosophers like Karl Popper uh, could be related to the Aristotelian ideas of teleological thinking, who argue for, for a theory called evolutionary epistemology, where nature is seen as an inherently purposeful entity. So, uh, it is not that only human beings have a purpose in their life, but nature in itself has, has a purpose and that is inherent in it. So, that is what I would like to uh, talk about.